we start a reflection on Paul for everyone. It is the letter to Philemon. It was a good place for a child to start because it's a very warm and human story. And though I have seen much more in it over the years than I did at the age of five, it'd be rather sad if I hadn't, I remember it fondly because of that early start. I suspect you may know the story, at least the story as far as we can reconstruct it. Paul is in prison. We're not quite sure where, but if I had to uh, to put money on it, though of course bishops aren't betting men, perish the thought, um, I would guess that Paul is currently in prison in Ephesus on the west coast of ancient Turkey, Asia Minor as it was called. And inland from Ephesus, it's difficult to find now, but you can if you ask the right people, the right guides and so on, is a town called Colossae, where, of course, he wrote the letter to the Colossians too. And in Colossae, there lived a man called Philemon, who was reasonably well off, who had become a Christian, and who, like almost everybody else who had any means at all in the ancient world, owned slaves. Now... Slavery is, of course, a huge topic in itself. I don't want to go there particularly, just to park that at the moment by saying that if somebody had stood up in the first century and said, I want you all to give up your slaves now, just let them go, that would be roughly the same as if I were to say to you tonight, I want you all to stop using your cars as of right now. We may know that cars pollute the planet. We may know that they're nasty, dangerous, expensive, uh, dirty things, but we are sort of stuck with them. That's how our society works. And I think a lot of people, and Paul seems to be one of them, felt rather like that about slavery. Let's just park that there. Ask me about it later if you want. What had happened was Paul in prison in Ephesus, Philemon and a few other Christians, not many, in Colossae, a couple of days' journey, maybe three, three days' journey, depending how far you walked in a day. Onesimus, a slave, his name means useful, had run away. Now, if you were a slave, running away was serious. You might as well have committed murder for all the good it would do you. If you were caught, you might well be very severely punished, quite likely killed, quite likely killed brutally, Let's be kind to Philemon. He mightn't have had Onesimus actually crucified, but other people might well have done that. Slaves were nothing. They were worthless. If we're thinking of Paul for everyone, we're thinking of human beings, but in the ancient world, a lot of people regarded slaves as, at best, subhuman. Anyway, Onesimus, having run away from his master, as slaves sometimes did, went to the nearest big city... Ephesus in this case and what's he going to do there's a price on his head Philemon or somebody will come after him and he finds Paul in prison how he found him we don't know but he found him and maybe claimed refuge with him and Onesimus became a Christian Paul says if you look down at verse 10 I'm appealing to you for my child Onesimus whose father I have become during my imprisonment. I sometimes used to say to students when I was teaching in the university that if the only document we had from early Christianity was this letter to Philemon, we could deduce a very great deal about what Christianity was from this letter alone because we know what happened to slaves in the ancient world and what is going on in this letter by contrast is just radically different. We can watch Paul in his theological and moral workshop dealing with a very immediate and pressing pastoral concern. Okay, Paul, you're a friend of Philemon's. He's a Christian. He's on your team. Here's a slave. We know what runaway slaves are like. They're probably up to no good. They certainly deserve a sound thrashing, quite possibly much worse. Maybe they should just be put to death. Poor encourage les autres. Well, says Paul, actually, Onesimus is now my child in the gospel. He has become a Christian. He has accepted Jesus. The life of the Holy Spirit is flooding through him. What am I going to do? And so Paul, being a letter writer, writes a letter. Dear Philemon, 
Guess what? Onesimus? Question mark. And look what he does. Verses 8 right through to, uh, to 13. He builds up this picture of Onesimus. And in particular, he builds up the fact that he, Paul, and Onesimus are absolutely bonded together. Look at it, verse 9, on the basis of love, that's Philemon's love for him, I'm appealing to you, verse uh, 10, for my child, Onesimus, whose father I've become. Formerly he was useless to you, but now, that's his name, you see, useful, useless, but now he is indeed useful, both to you and to me. I'm sending him back, I'm sending my own very heart. Sending him back, Paul, what are you doing? Well, yes, it's got to be done. Onesimus has got a face the reality of the situation and Philemon has got a face how easy it is isn't it and as pastors how naturally we would lurch for the option of oh no no let's squirrel Onesimus away let's send him off on a mission to Spain or something so that we just never need to no you can't do that when there's a situation to be faced you've got to face it but it's my own heart I wanted verse 13 to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment but I preferred to do nothing without your consent. See how Paul has built this up. When Onesimus, when Philemon reads this letter, he is seeing Paul and Onesimus standing there, linked arms, or Paul's arm round this lad's shoulders. And then, look what else he's doing. Verse 9, again, on the basis of love, and then, verse 13, so that he might be of service to me in your place. Do you see what he's saying? Philemon, I know that actually, if you had the chance, you would love to be here in Ephesus helping look after me in prison. I know you can't do that because you're a busy man where you are and you've got a family and perhaps a farm and all that, so I can't expect you to do that. But it's very kind of you to have lent me Onesimus for this moment. And then, verse 14, I prefer to do nothing without your consent so that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. I think Paul smiled as he wrote that, and I think even Philemon must have felt his lips twitching a bit when he read it. Yeah, yeah, Paul, you're putting the screws on me. We all know that. But you want me to do it. You see, Paul, and we'll come back to this from looking at one of the other passages, Paul wanted to make positions clear to people, theological positions, moral positions, but he wanted to do it in such a way that it became embedded in their character and not something superimposed from outside. And that's a very delicate business. You know the saying, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed him for life? Paul, again and again, worked on the principle that if you give someone a straight command, you get them to do what you want in this particular instance. But if you teach someone to think Christianly, you will enable them to grow as a human being and to figure out for themselves what God might want them to do in quite other situations. This is a very important principle about the nature of virtue, actually. I was giving a talk at a school, um, Barnard Castle, a bit south of here, uh, a year or so ago, and one of the other people, we, there was four or five of us on a panel, and we, we were each given the task of talking for a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, on the challenges facing this nation in the next generation. One of the other people on the panel was Rob Andrew, who many of you will know, former uh, Newcastle rugby man and now one of the very senior people in English rugby. And he was saying one of the problems in uh, senior rugby today is that whereas in his day they all grew up just throwing the ball around and kicking it this way and that and getting to know how the game worked from inside, today the players are so carefully coached and they learn every move so exactly that when they go on the field, they've got the coach telling them, now you do this, now you do that, now you do the other, in their heads. And if they're suddenly faced with a situation that the coach hadn't told them how to cope with, they don't know what to do. They're overcoached. And so they haven't learnt to intuit for themselves how to read the game and how to do new things within it. So Paul is like this. He's teaching Philemon to think Christianly about this extraordinary situation. And then, as a result, verse 17, if you consider me your partner, 
That's a business word where partners, we're in this, what is the business? Well, it's the gospel, of course. The gospel is an ongoing concern, and Philemon, you and I are partners in it. And partners in the ancient world wasn't just a contract that you might make and then break a few years later. Once you were in, you were in. Big time. Major mutual responsibilities. And then verse 18, if he's wronged you in any way, charge that to my account, because I'll repay it. But verse 19b, I say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. Because, Philemon, remember, the reason you're a Christian actually is because I, Paul, uh, came and brought the message of the Lord to you. Therefore, I want this benefit back from you, verse 20. Refresh my heart in Christ. Oh, and by the way, verse 22, hoping to be out of jail soon, it'd be really nice to come and pay you a visit. Yeah, it would, wouldn't it? want to see what's happened. Now, do you see what's happened? Here is Paul standing here with one arm round Onesimus, so that when Philemon looks at Paul and Onesimus, he sees them absolutely bonded. Here's the other arm now firmly round Philemon himself. Because, Philemon, you owe me everything, actually, and we are partners. And do you see what Paul has done in this short letter he has modeled the message which he has preached, the message of the reconciling love of God in Christ, with arms outstretched on the cross to Jew and Gentile, black and white, male and female, slave and free. And see how it works. Verse 17, verse 18, welcome him as you would welcome me. When you get him, you're getting me. And then, if he's wronged you in any way, put it to my account. Here is Paul daring in this pastoral situation to be in the middle in the way that Jesus was in the middle. So that there, between heaven and earth, between God and humankind, Jesus stood with Jesus saying to the Father, if they've wronged you in any way, put it down on my account. The letter to Philemon, we don't know, of course, what happened, except I suspect the letter mightn't have survived if Philemon hadn't actually said, yeah, I get the point. We don't know that for sure, but I think it's quite likely. The letter to Philemon stands as a witness that when Paul was there for everyone, he meant everyone, from the landowner to the slave and everyone in between. And the message that he brought them was not a message simply from the head and the mouth, but a message from the heart to be lived out and worked out in the pastoral realities of these situations which were as tense then in the first century as they would be today, where there are social expectations and cultural expectations and anger. You know, this man's run away. He may have stolen something from me. How, how can you possibly say... Put it down on my account, Philemon, and then think what that's going to mean. Paul for everyone, seen in that little vignette, that little microcosm, that little gem we call the letter to Philemon.